Because yeah. you know, it happens. Yeah. It happens. But- no, no, but but Amy, thank you for coming on. It's uh, appreciated that you you took uh, you've taken some time out of your day to come on and speak to myself about all things music. Uh, what I like to do is talk about music, um, your influences, growing up, learning your instrument, gigging, recording. Just get your thoughts on on lots of different aspects uh, to music. But before we get started, uh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm a little tired, but I'm doing okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. Are you on vacation? Are you on, are you on tour or are you on vacation? No, no. I'm on tour. We've been. Uh, we left Memphis on May 9th, and uh, we've been on tour ever since. So it's been a really a long a long yeah. one, and uh, we're just rounding the corner. So our last gig is in Austin on uh, on the 8th of this month, and then we. Right. Then we get to go home. But tonight's, you know, it's the Independence Day here. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so it's a, it's a night off, and we're in uh, we're in Nebraska, hence the corn curtains, which is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, they're having a little street festival this afternoon, just downstairs from our really kind of swank hotel tonight. Right. Hence the corn curtains, but. And is it the same band, um, band mates that you're touring with? Um, it's just myself and Will Sexton, who is my husband. He's playing guitar, mm-hmm. and so um, we're just a duo this run. The tour was too long, and it's too expensive right now to bring the whole band. Like, okay, everything you know, just it's just really, really expensive. Hotels are like double what they used to be. Yeah. So what I, what I like to do, Amy, is I like to go back to the very beginning with the guests. So where originally were you brought up? Uh, I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, um, but I was only there for the first couple of years of my life, and then I grew up in a Texas-Louisiana border town called Bethany until I was almost six, and then uh, the family started traveling a lot because of my dad's job, so I spent most of my childhood um, outside of Toronto and Detroit and um, a little time in Baltimore, just sort of... Okay. Bouncing around Ohio, wherever my dad's job with General Motors took him. And did you have um, exposure to music from a young age? Were your parents into music? Oh yeah, my my mom uh, she played just kind of cowboy chords on guitar and wrote hippie hippie songs. And uh, yeah. my dad actually was a drummer. Um, he got a scholarship to go to university. Uh, for playing drums, but he didn't. Right. I never knew him to be a drummer myself. That was before, before me. But because of it, I think he was always really supportive of music. He loved music. Mm-hmm. He played. He played the steering wheel. I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so, what sort of music were they listening to? What type of bands or artists were they were they listening to when you were growing up? Oh, uh, pretty pretty much, uh, you know, classic country, and. Um, yeah, you know, folk music and country really was the mainstays. My dad did have this. Um, he had a he had a pink, hot pink eight track tape of Black Sabbath, which was, he really liked that. But that was really the only kind of rock and roll like that that my parents ever yeah. had playing in the house. He he did play that particular cassette, but mostly yeah. it was just the just whatever was on the radio there in the seventies. You know. Yeah. What what about what about for yourself then? What, was there an age that you discovered your own musical taste? And if so, what, what were some of the, the bands or artists that you were discovering for yourself that was different from what your parents were listening to? Oh, I, I think I kind of went through all of the traditional phases of music that a kid growing up in the 80s and the 90s did. You know, it's like... I. I mean, I had like a, a fa I, I was some, you know, I've always kind of been the kind of person that when I found something I really liked, I just sort of, you know, wore it out, just played it to death. But yeah. I was um, in middle school. I think I was uniquely sort of Beatles crazy. Um, I had an advanced book report class that I, I chose some sort of Beatles centric biography to write about every yeah. time, in, in so much that my. Um, my teacher had sent home a letter to my mom asking her to encourage me to broaden my interests and uh, she saved the letter but she never showed it to me so she was just happy I was into something and reading but yeah uh, you know I had a I had a Grateful Dead phase I, I was really into the cure I just sort of 
and and then the, I guess there was a moment where um, I got I got really into very old classic country, kind of um, nearing the end of my high school mm-hmm. years, which was kind of unique and probably, but it was probably influenced by a much older friend of my sister's named John, who was into that type of music. And do you remember what the first music album was that you ever bought with your own money? Um, with my own money. Um, hmm. So, so not a present from a parent at Christmas or on a birthday, but you went into the music shop and actually bought it for yourself? No, I don't. I don't remember what that would have been. I don't remember what that would have been. Do you, do you I had remember? an older sister. She was three years older than me, so ah, right. it was likely like me going and raiding her collection. Yeah. What about your... Do you remember your first concert? I do remember my first concert, and um, it was uh, me and I was very young too. I think I was in maybe third or fourth grade. I mean, granted, my, we grew up, grew up going to bluegrass festivals forever, yeah, yeah. so I saw a lot of music, live music. But when we were living in Canada, I guess I was fourth grade because we were living outside of Toronto, and my friend's dad took the two of us to go see this band that was popular in Canada at the time called The Spoons. And they were just like, a, you know, they were like a rock and roll band from, you know, the mid 80s or something. And I, late 80s. And uh, I just remember being terribly embarrassed because it was a lot of older kids. And he made us put go in the bathroom and put toilet paper in our ears because he thought it was too loud for us. And I was pissed. <laughs> I was so humiliated. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, I've, I've seen you um, perform. I know it's the upright bass that you play. Yeah. Why the upright bass? Why not the guitar or the drums or the bass guitar? What was it that, that made you pick up that instrument? Or was there an instrument before that? Yeah, um, actually, you know, I, I took a little tiny bit of piano lessons when I was a kid, not enough to get very good at it. Um, I was a drummer in my first band, which was a um, kind of a, well, it was a ridiculous middle school punk band called um, The Blatant Deathmongers. And I was terrible at it. I mean, I would, I could really hold this one beat really good, and then if I hit a cymbal, all was lost. Yeah. And then um, I took to playing cowboy chords like my mom and trying to write songs. And um, but it wasn't until I moved to Nashville that I was renting a room, um, and there was you know several musicians that rent, rented rooms out of this big old house in East Nashville, and there were two upright bass players there, and I just, right. I just really took to it. It was you know. Bass is one note at a time. I knew enough of the um, structure of music that it translated into me being pretty yeah. good at it right out of the gate because, you know, it was one note at a time and I had great rhythm. And it, so it just it felt most natural where guitar has always been sort of a mathematically laborious sort of thing for me. It's never come naturally to me. So What came first? Was it, was it playing the upright bass or was it singing? Which one came first? Oh, definitely singing. Yeah, I was, I was a little choir nerd in high school and middle school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's done you well so far. What's that? I'm saying it's done you well so far. Yeah, it's okay. I mean. Yeah. I um, so, I was trying to think. When was the first time I saw yourself? And I can only think that it was. Supporting C6 Steve. Yeah. So I, I saw C6 Steve the first time he, he toured in the UK, and it wasn't yourself, it was another support band he had. So I think, was it maybe the second tour? It was definitely the second tour. Yeah, it was. But um, I actually, I've got a man cave at the side of my house, and there's a, there's a big notice board that's got all the ticket stubs, and, and I actually found this. So oh I'll my hold God. This, if you can I see it. I had one. Oh my God. <laughs> so crazy. So I, I had one of those. That was like really one of my favorite experiences of my entire life. Yeah, so so that that would have been I don't know if that was the same tour that, that you all you, you played or if that was the second time you came back that, that because I got obviously got a ticket and I'm I'm trying to think I, I don't think I would have got a ticket having never heard you before. So I think I've seen you support C6 Steve. And then you maybe supported them a second time 
but he's done your own gig at King Tut's in Glasgow, like the night before? Maybe something like that. That's so long ago. I don't know that I'd remember, but I do know that it started for me getting to open some shows for him, and yeah. then he had me come back and um, had me play bass in the, in the show with him for. Yeah, well, I've seen that. That was obviously later, like a, yeah. a tour after that. But obviously, it was yourself, and you had your drummer, and I don't know if it's the guitarist it was your, your husband that's there now or. Oh, no, that uh, that guitarist at the time was uh, his name was uh, Steve Selvage, and he's the guitar player now in the band The Hold Steady. Ah, right, okay. Yeah. The, obviously, um, yeah, it was just it was something different because you you don't hear maybe, maybe if you look in the right place, but in general you don't hear that type of music in Scotland. It's uh, C six Steve type music, you mean? Your, yourself. My music, yeah, Americana sort of. Yeah, or, or even Seasick Steve. It, it was so it was something quite refreshing because because it's got a big following, but it's not something that you hear. Like if you were to go into Glasgow just now, you could go around twenty different bars, and I'll guarantee you won't hear anybody playing that sort of stuff. It's just not something that's that's done too often. Right. But um, it, it has a big following, and um, I. You know, C6 Steve, it was the the Jules Holland yeah. um, New Year TV show. And it was it was funny because we what you know, every single year we turn that on just to see who's playing because sometimes you'll get a new artist that you've never heard and, and he appeared. And, of course, the, the next day I phoned my dad and I said, yeah. Dad, did you, watch, did you watch that show last night? He's like, oh, did you see that that C6 Steve guy? I was like, yeah, how cool is he? <laughs> and I was like, right, next time he's in Glasgow, I says, we'll get tickets. And then obviously we saw yourselves. And uh, so the next time you came on tour, I was like, oh, he's got the same support band, but they're playing in King Tut's the night before, so let's get tickets. And we went along and, and cheered you on. So it, it, was a, it was a good night. But um, obviously... We had a couple of your albums, and there was like the main one um, that had the, the big hit, um, Kill, Killing Him Didn't Make the Love Go Away. So, obviously, you've, you've wrote quite a few albums since then, but has your method for writing a song always stayed the same? Like, what is your method for writing a song? Well, um,. I, it's gotten harder for me to write songs. I mean, I think they, they used to just kind of come out and, you know, we had a, I guess kind of when you're a kid and or when you're younger and you're new in the game, for me, um, you know, when there wasn't an eye on you, what you were doing, it seemed like there was a lot more freedom in the way that I would write. And then, yeah. um, and also, you know, people were, we were all young. And so band rehearsal was this big, joyous, fun party that would happen every week, you know? And so you'd have people to, try out your new songs with and there's just something about that part of life that time of my life that was easier and and that was fun yeah. and now it's like um, especially through the pandemic I got really um, and also just the time that it is right now in the world it's like I felt like either I couldn't write something enough to meet the moment without it sounding sort of trite like I've really kind of struggled with the yeah the landscape of um, writing because you know my nature is to be really optimistic and have a very shiny disposition and I think a lot of times when I get going to writing it's like that's maybe where I express my the things that are sort of troubling to me and yeah um, yeah so it hasn't really been a very fun process lately so I've labored over this new record for quite some time to try to find my sense of humor again and, and, and it's, back. it's amazing as well when when you're younger you yeah. you you just write. I think as you, as you get older, you tend to start overthinking things totally. as well. Absolutely. I, think, I guarantee you that's what... I mean, it's... And it's I, I'm getting you're maybe in the position where you don't want to repeat yourself. It's a lot of things. As yeah. well. I had a band a band on that are that are from Scotland, but they're getting really big. You know, they've, they've played the, the Barrowlands and all that. They're, they're becoming really big. And they've done their first two albums within the last ten years. Sorry, probably within the last seven years. It was just before COVID that they got together as a band, and uh, two albums came out straight away. Right. Uh, they were really, really good, and they're really struggling 
now to do the third album because they're having to now think about things and it's not quite as fun as it used to be because there's there's expectations now even although guaranteed whatever they release their fans will love it but I think they, they are starting to overthink things because I was speaking to them and they've been in and out the studio for the last year trying to get some songs together and it, it is coming together very slowly but yeah. uh, I suppose yeah. I, you get a wee bit older you start to overthink things a wee bit yeah, you know, just it's like um, you go through so many different phases when you're getting, you know, touching some sort of popularity and coming and going with it, and um, you know, sometimes people too put too much importance on what you think, you know, like yeah. as if I as if I have some sort of answer that they don't have, and um, that's not true. So it's like then you start struggling with like your own self importance and your insecurity, and just it's a. It's kind of a mind fuck, actually, but I'm, I finally have you know a batch of tunes that I feel really um, authentic about, and that I that I think make a great project, and and uh, hopefully we'll be finished mixing in the couple of weeks after we get back to Memphis. And so, have have you done the recording part of it already? Yeah, it's all been recorded. There's just a couple of songs that yet need to, you know, like a. A little tweak here and there, a little remix, I think, and then uh, meaning th the record has not been mixed. We have to yeah. mix the record, but yeah, it's all been recorded. So, do do you have a pref preferred way of recording in the studio? Do do you record live, or do you do you do the drums and lay everything on top of it? How do you go about it? Well, um, because of the because of the musicians that are on the record with me. Um, Everybody's working, everybody's really busy, our time schedules are all over the place, so there's, you know, maybe half of the record was recorded live when we were all happened to be in town, yeah. and then, you know, there are other songs on the record that we had to compromise, and pretty pretty much every time, at least the bass and the drums were recorded live, um, and usually the, the vocal, I would do a scratch vocal, if not the, if not, you know, there some some of them were first takes, but most of them had to have a... Yeah. The vocals on, but. Have you heard of a, Have you heard of someone called Nathan Bell? No, I, I don't. No, know. he's like sort of out Tennessee. We had him on, and uh, he was playing in Glasgow just uh, about a month ago. I went went to see him play, and he was telling me when he records, he, he records guitar and vocals completely live, and then yeah. everybody adds on top of that, no click track or anything. That because I'm more from a rock background, that blew my mind that. Well, I think that's pretty common, actually. Yeah. Because you got to get the artist, I think, to to have their their spirit be the most omnipresent part of it, and I think that especially with the songwriters, that that's kind of a a really good way to make sure that the spirit of the song is intact before people start to mess it up and <laughs> you know yeah. build on it. It's funny. Uh, the band that I was talking to from Australia just yesterday, um, so they, they're kind of a sort of rock background and. And I'd ask them, you know, how do you go about recording? And they'd said the opposite. Now, there's not a right or a wrong way, but um, they were saying that they'll do it to a clip track and it's got to be 100% spot on. Because I had said to them, do you not worry that you might lose the feel of the song? Because it's, it's almost too perfect. But it just depends maybe on, on the style as well. Like one of the, one of the bands that I really love, uh, one of the older bands is The Doors. Yeah, me too. Well, and what I really like about them is that they, they recorded it live in the studio. So they just mic'd everything up and yeah. then they hit record. Now, part of that would have been because of the limitations they had with the recording gear back then. Sure. But they're a real band. They had to go in and play. If they made a mistake, they would maybe try and fix it with a wee overdub, but... It was pretty much live, and a lot of bands were the same, you know, like Credence, Clearwater Revival, The Who, The Rolling Stones, all these type of bands, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I think I like that method, but I'm probably not brave enough to try it myself. Uh, well, you know, if you ever come to Memphis, um, there's uh, there's Sun Studio, you know, you don't even have the option, it goes right to tape, so you go there yeah. and make, make a record, and those rec recordings usually turn out really great, you know, it's like... Yeah. So we're obviously, we're halfway through 2024. What is the plans then for the rest of the year for yourself? 
Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Finishing this record is paramount um, to really continuing my career whatsoever. It's like I, I need to get some new music out in the world, and so that's that's first and foremost. And we have another tour coming up. Uh, we've been, you know, up zigzagging up and down the west coast of the U.S., and uh, now we're, we've we've headed east, and we're heading back through the the middle, the corn, the corn <laughs> yeah. land of corn of the United States, and then. Uh, we're home for just a little bit, and in September we go up the East Coast. So there's another big tour for me, um, getting this record out, and uh, and I, I think you know my last record, which I'm really proud of, that of course came out right at the pandemic, so it, yeah. um, it didn't really see the light of day. Um, and I, it was my first experience, for the most part, trying to release a record with my own administrative skills, which I learned are subpar at best. <laughs> So um, at the final hour, I'd called my friend who owns a label in Austin called Nine Mile Records, and they helped me um, wrap up some loose ends, basically. But um, it, for the most part, it was a self-release, and so this... Do you, do you see... I really want to pitch, pitch the record to a label and uh, mm-hmm. try to get a little help. Just do you see yourself coming back across to the UK, or, or would it need to be as part of supporting maybe someone... Um, no, we would have to tour on our own uh, because, uh, I mean, as, as grateful as we'd be f- for a great support situation, usually they don't pay enough to make it financially worthwhile for us to come over there. We do a little better even if we're not getting in front of the big, big crowds and we're doing it on our own. We usually do a little better. But yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we had some tickets to come to the UK um, in January for the Americana conference this year. and then. Right. Um, I, for a brief second, I had a new manager that dropped the ball and um, didn't do his part to register us in time. So we ended up um, going to Alaska last week just to use those tickets before they expired. But, <laughs> but yes, we are definitely coming back to the UK, and um, you know, cool. so I, I love going there, and I want to keep a presence. And I, you know, in a real in a dream world, I'd be coming every year. Yeah. So anyone fo- following you, they can check you out on social media, on the website, if they want to find out news on the, any new albums, new recordings, touring dates, all that sort of thing. But Amy, we've obviously been quite technical talking about music stuff. What I like to do is, is end things on a few fun questions for you. Okay. So imagine that you could go back in time, you could go anywhere in the world... Big concert, small concert. What's the one concert that you wish you could have attended? Hmm. One concert. Uh, probably. Um, I think. Uh, hang on, it's going to take me a minute to remember what it's actually. Oh, I'd like to have been in the audience of the last waltz. The whole the whole filming of that thing would have been probably my yeah. dream. You know of which I speak. The last waltz. Do you Sorry. Know, do you know the last waltz? No. Okay, so it was a big concert with a bunch of bands that was put on. I, th- I think it was put on by the band. The band. All right, okay. Yeah, so check out The Last Waltz. It's a video now, you know, you can watch it. But it's got everybody from Neil Young to Joni Mitchell to Bob Dylan to... I mean, it's just... Check it out. That's the one. Cool, I'll do that. Um, obviously, you play upright bass. Is there another instrument that you wish that you could play? Um, definitely piano. I mean... Yeah. I, I can poke around on a piano, but I, I really wish I knew how to play the piano. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it's, you know, it's a long life shit. I yeah. might, might figure it out at some point. <laughs> As you know yourself, there is lots and lots of really, really good songs that have been recorded across the years. What is the one song that you wish you could have been in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Um, well, you know, there's... Um, that's kind of a trick question because I there's so many recordings I would have liked to have seen happen. Um, I can tell you the one song that I, I always is my my go to song uh, that I like to listen to. I've never thought about seeing it recorded, but is Albatross. Uh, I don't know. You know. I, I probably would have really liked to have been in the room to see Phil Spector work on <laughs> super layered up crazy stuff, but that would be from a technical side. That wouldn't have been because it would, would might have been moving yeah. or not. But. And I, I know that you'd obviously had a little uh, a wee cameo in Walk the Line. Walk uh, the Line, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, 
Is acting something that you're interested in go down the line? Is that something else that you would continue to do? Yeah, very much actually. Um, I haven't, you know, I didn't really feel like I was worthy of it because it wasn't really a craft that I honed. It was I sort of stumbled into every little indie film and acting thing I ever got to do. But as I got older, um, and that, I think I think I, I do think that I have a, a little bit of a natural ability, and um, yeah, you know I travel so much and I play so much. It's yeah. hard to imagine carving out the time for it. But I, I do fantasize about about working in that medium yeah. again. So it is really. So really if we don't see you, if we don't see you on the stage, it might be on the big screen. So repeat it. You froze up for just a second. Oh, you that's fine. Um, I was just saying. So, if we if we don't see you on the stage in the future, it might be that we see you on the big screen instead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Where things happen, right? Yeah. And uh, the last question for you: Who's your Mount Rushmore for bands or musicians? Who's the four bands or musicians that, for yourself? you just see as perfection? These are really tough questions. Um, uh, and you, you, can't say, you can't say your husband just because he's maybe there. <laughs> um, I don't know. Can I pass on that? There's just so many. I just, I could just start. I mean, I, yeah. You, I could pick, you could pick four, four today. And then if, if you're like me, you could pick another four tomorrow and then another four and then... Okay, it, okay. so I'll, I'll tell you what I'm listening to. So they're as perfect as it gets for me right now. So okay. I'm, I'm crazy about Tanarwin. I've just been nuts about that band for a while. Um, if I just go to put on music, uh, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of Chet Baker lately. Chet Baker is probably one of my all-time go-to artists. Mm -hmm. um, I love Feist, you know, popular music. Feist yep. is uh, somebody I really admire and look up to. And um, actually, um, this vocal ability, uh, Ron Sexsmith, I, I'm a huge Ron Sexsmith fan. And cool. uh, I love Bill Callahan. I love Johnny Dowd. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, John there's Jett. so so many. You could probably go on forever, and, and, and I, still, yeah, I could. Yeah. And you know, as far as I don't think any of them are perfect, and that's probably what I love about them. You know, like, yeah. So. Well, Amy, thank you so much for coming on. Anyone that's listening, they can obviously um, check out your tour dates. They can check out all the merchandise, um, future news, all that sort of thing. You're on social media, you've got your website, they can check you out. But thank you for uh, giving me 40 minutes of your time. We got there in the end, trying to get a date and a time sorted. And uh, next time you're over in the UK uh, on tour, um, I'll give you a wee shout and I'll probably come along and cheer you on. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you. Appreciate it. That's great. Thank you. All right, bye. Thanks.